of our public lecture series at the Global Environmental Law Centre. It's good to have you here. It's really nice to see some of my online LLM students. I only see your faces on the screen, so it's good to see you in person. I just want to welcome the Dean. Thank you, Prof. Deville, for joining us today as well. And then, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Professor Van der Schwartz. He uh, is the head of school and Professor of Global Environmental Law at Southampton Law School, the University of Southampton in the UK. He's also uh, an extraordinary professor of the Global Environmental Law Centre. And for those of you who don't know, he really was the person who birthed and conceptualised the Global Environmental Law Centre. So really a special guest to have today. He, ex he specialises in international environmental law and his current research focuses on the consequences of increasing importance of animal welfare for international wildlife law. He is an Alexander van Humboldt Fellow and was a Garagas and coffee roaster before he moved to the UK. His research is really important and um, showcases an on ongoing theme at GALC because, as you may know, we have new modules, one on constitutional law and nature, which strongly focuses on wildlife conservation, biodiversity, rights of nature, and we have a new LLM kicking off or new LLM module kicking off next year on animal rights and law. So your research is really relevant to all of my students sitting here today. But without further ado, I'm going to give over to you, and we look forward to hearing from you. And then one more point for logistics. For the online viewers, the audio isn't uh, working today, just so if you have a question, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you have a question, please post it in the chat, and we'll make sure Proskos gets to hear your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for uh, those kind words. It is indeed a delight and pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, this, before I commence with the discussion, I just need to uh, maybe illuminate the fact that this presentation is based on a forthcoming publication in the Journal of International Wildlife Law and Policy, which is quite a comprehensive publication, and therefore I will only give you a short summary of the, the gist or the gist of that publication. We're not able to deal with all the aspects. It's also um, part of ongoing research that, I've, that I actually started in 2016, I think. And, and it's interesting to see how this has developed also internationally. Initially, when I started with this work, it was sort of on the fringes of international environmental law. Um, and, and recently, a colleague of mine, Ann Peters, actually delivered the, the, the eight lectures on animals in international law. So, very interesting. And I'm also very glad to hear um, that it's one of the focal areas at your law school. So, without further ado, um, uh, thank you also for, for assisting me with the, the PowerPoint presentation. You can skip the the slide, um, yes, um, yes, let's start there. So the, the issue that I would like to discuss today, and, I've, and, and as I've mentioned, some of these strands have been covered in previous uh, presentations, but the issue I'd like to discuss today is the fact that when we look at biodiversity and the anthropogenic effects on biodiversity, especially the shrinking of habitat, so what we see in terms of this course currently is that, that changing habitat, that decreasing habitat, that result in the constrictions of species into certain areas. So we see a more controlled environment, and therefore we have debates concerning what is, you know, what is nature and what is really pristine nature and wild and so forth, and wildlife. But we see the effect or the consequences of the Anthropocene in terms of a shrinking habitat, meaning that there's more contact between humans and animals. And in terms of biodiversity, and we see this also in the Convention of Biological Diversity, in response to this factual scenario, we notice that there's a move towards ex situ conservation methods. Ex situ meaning, which is the opposite, in situ, obviously. Examples of ex situ um, or, and I've just given you one, captive breeding, for instance, and, and you see that in South Africa as well. So moving towards captive breeding, zoos, aquarium, and so forth, as methods of, ex, of outside of the normal habitat of animals 
uh, ensuring conservation. Now, due to the fact that you have that, the next thing is obviously that due to the, the more controlling environment, meaning more human control over species, we notice that there are calls for welfare, protecting the welfare of these, these animals. Because that is obviously important in a controlled environment due to the intrusive measures being applied. Now, I've written on, on welfare and, and, and uh, a number of publications and books and so forth in this field. And I've always wondered about the other side of the spectrum. Because when you talk about animal protection, there are two strands on a spectrum. I'm talking about a spectrum. Welfareism, so prevention of suffering, for instance. And the other side, you have animal rights theory, which actually focus on the, focus on the issue of abolition. So you have those two sides on the spectrum of protection. And I've never really, I've always had this in my mind, that if I engage with the issue of welfareism, one also needs to take, or at least give attention to the issue of animal rights theory. It's never really been done in, in legal scholarship. And the reason being, essentially, there's always been that hands-off approach. So yes, we do have animal rights theory discourse pertaining to companion animals and farm animals and so forth. But in relation to wild animals, it is very problematic. And that's why Regan has always mentioned this hands-off approach. The reason for that is obviously when we talk about wild animals, we talk about predation, for instance. We talk about nature. And there's a social distance existing between wild animals and humans. But what we've noticed also is a, a, an interesting form of development concerning this, these perspectives. The one thing is the Mexican case law. If you consider cases such as Chuchu, or um, Estrelita, for instance, or the wild birds case in India, those cases actually awarded rights to wild animals, for instance, sometimes in captivity. So there is a change towards the perceptions concerning the obligations relating to those wild animals. And we can also see that in scholarship, not necessarily legal scholarship, but if you consider, for, for instance, um, environmental ethics, and the scholarship of careers and so forth, you will see that there's a clear move away from a hands-off approach. It's not really been dealt with in terms of, of, of legal scholarship per se. So that hands-off approach has been rejected, and we now know that scholars do agree that positive obligations exist concerning all animals. But there's obviously dispute and disagreement concerning the exact content of, of those obligations. And therefore that led me to the question, or actually compelled me, mandated me to, 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 to consider this issue of, of rights concerning wild animals. And one of the, I think my mic is just right, but I think you can hear me. Yes. Oh yes, it's for the obvious thing, so I'll sing. Um, I feel like a rock and roll star now. <laughs> The, the, one, the one interesting proposal that has been made by a few scholars, Cavalieri and, for instance, Unpeters, was also to consider the extension of international human rights principles to its, to its animals, not wild animals, but animals in general, so in a generic form. And next slide, please. And it's in this vein that I found it very interesting and compelling to explore these matters. Because what we can see is there's a potential overlap between the issue of animal rights and human rights. And it's that overlap based on the natural law justification for protection that we can actually reformulate certain core human rights for animals. And I've referred to life, liberty, and freedom. There's also another, for me, a very attractive aspect to the utilization of IHR for, and in this case, wild animals. And that's the issue of international protection and scrutiny. There's a clear need for the globalization of animal concerns. And that is, I mean, the scholarship 
um, actually clearly stipulates the reasons for this, but we can see there's a global, it has a global nature. For instance, global trade is one aspect. But in terms of biodiversity, what we see in the CBD is that although the CBD focuses on territorial sovereignty in countries, domestic jurisdiction, we do see that there's a globalization in terms of the preamble, which refers to the common concern. And in a recent publication in a book, and I think it was called Global, Global Handbook, Oxford Handbook on Animal Rights, edited by Ann Peters, I think it will be published next year, I, I argued on the basis of common concern for the globalization of welfare concerns pertaining to wild animals. So international human rights actually fit the bill in terms of the necessity for international protection and scrutiny. And another colleague of mine, Stuckey, referred, referred to the acute sense of ecological necessity to actually extend or award rights to animals in this sense. It is my view, and as I've mentioned, I'm not able to delve into you know, all the detail here, but in this public publication I indicate that these rights are specific group-based rights, so they're group-based. But these rights differ in substance. So you have, you have overarching animal rights, but under those animal rights you have rights for domesticated animals, for farm animals, and for wild animals. But it's under group-based rights. And the, the interesting thing is it's also due to the relational and locational differences between wild animals and, for instance, domesticated animals. And it's very similar to the utilization of rights in international human rights theory, for instance, for generic rights that we have overarchingly, but we have certain rights for women, for children, and so forth and so forth. So very, very similar um, to that sort of approach being followed. These specific group-based rights, which I propose in the publication, is based on what I refer to as non-exclusionary dignity, because dignity is a central concept also in international human rights law, being used to award, to award rights to human beings. And it's that dignity which may be used to determine the specific rights of specific wild animals on an individual level. So you can actually tailor the content of those, those rights to the well-being interests and needs of specific animals in terms of that relational, situational, and locational context. Next slide, please. The sort of the problem or the awarding of rights for wild animals, in my mind, is actually part of this evolutionary response to the ecological and welfare threats against wild animals. Ecological in the context of the consequences of the Anthropocene, shrinking habitat, climate change, loss of biodiversity. But it's also the welfare components and the recognition that when we talk about species, those species comprise of individual animals. And those individual animals have certain welfare needs and interests. And therefore, what we essentially see is this proposal based on non-exclusionary dignity is the is sort of the next step in the progressive development of human rights to include other vulnerable entities in, in, in our society. So it's very much in line with the sort of the progressive development and thinking of human rights on the international plane. So far, so good. Um, you know, sort of to an extent may make sense. Some of the things that I've mentioned, maybe you think it doesn't, but it has certain sort of logical grounding. There is, however, one but here, or a major but, and that's the elephant in the room. This proposal, and this is the reason why legal scholars have always refrained from following this line of thought, is the fact that there's major tension between the holistic ethics of environmentalism, so the ethics underlying international environmental law concerning the conservation and sustainable use of biological resources, its holism, on the one hand, and the ethics 
of welfare, on the other hand, concerning individual animals. So we have those two opposing sides. And to explain that further, is the best example is invasive alien species. Thank you. When we talk about invasive alien species, what we see in Article 8H of the CBD, there's a provision which requires the prevention or to prevent the introduction of control or eradicate those alien species which threaten the holism, ecosystems, habitats, all species. So it's that, that holism that is threatened. And therefore, in terms of the environmental approach, lethal eradication, lethal termination of those species are obliged or mandated in order to respond to the needs of the whole. And that is the tension that you find in terms of the welfare ethics. Because when such an obligation is realized, it means that there is an effect on the, or the, the individual components of the species will be affected in terms of their welfare needs. And that is the problem here. So there's clearly a tension. So my proposal that I've just presented to you is highly problematic in terms of this context. And the question is, is it irreconcilable? And the good, or the, the, the answer here, the positive answer, is no, it's not insurmountable. We, we also see this tension, and I'll explain this now, we also see this tension in the preamble of the Convention on Biological Diversity. It refers to intrinsic value, which is very interesting. The intrinsic value of uh, the conservation of biological diversity. If you read that preamble in the context of the provisions of the CBD, you will see that prima facie, it seems that intrinsic value is at the species level, which is also quite problematic. And therefore, initially, and it's all, the whole CBD, you can see the reflection or the, that underlying trend of holism in the CBD. It does not deal with individual animals, it deals with species. It deals with the protection of the whole, not individual welfare. But the interesting thing is that reference to intrinsic actually opens the door for welfare considerations. And we find that in Guiding Principle 12 of the Guiding Principles for the Prevention, Introduction and Mitigation of Alien Species that threaten ecosystems, habitats or species. Because there, you can see in terms of invasive alien species, there is a reference to ethically acceptable methods to be used. So that's that door that is being opened in conjunction with a reference to intrinsic. Next slide, please. If we read further, the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of the Parties Decision 7 on Sustainable Use refers to uh, the ethical and humane use of components of biodiversity. And just preceding that part, there's a reference again to intrinsic. And in the review of the European Community and International Environmental Law, I argued that that ethical and humane use actually is a, an excellent hook for the consideration of welfare concerns in terms of sustainable use. If we take cognizance of those principles and the preamble, we see that member states should essentially consider, when they consider those techniques of, of eradication, of lethally terminating certain invasive alien species, they should take cognizance of the welfare interests of individual animals. So in moving towards responding to the threats, to the whole, there needs to be cognizance taken of the individual components of the whole, in terms of the principles that I've mentioned. And therefore I've proposed that member states must opt for non-lethal measures where possible, such as fertility control. And I just, just in terms of a footnote, I'm not stating that it's always possible, and we can have some discussions about this further. And there's also clearly the need to, to prevent, and if it's not possible to prevent, mitigate the suffering of those individual animals 
and that are targeted. So it's my view that the CBD does not exclude the recognition of intrinsic value of individual alien, the individual animals relating to those individual, uh, those invasive alien species. Next slide, please. What I do think is, and, and this is, this is part of the conundrum to an extent, because when we talk about intrinsic value, we talk about the two companions of genotype and phenotype. So it's also the individual and the whole. The one part is where uh, the good of its kind, so meaning that at species level, you need a certain threshold of animals. So it's that issue of conserved conservation. But on the other hand, you have good of its own. We have issues pertaining to nutrition, uh, nurturing animals, and that's the welfare component. When we talk about intrinsic value in terms of the CBD, I think the references to intrinsic value in the preamble, in conjunction with COP7 decision and the guiding principles, it is clear to me that, and this is the problematic aspect, if you read that and your argument is there is a recognition of intrinsic value of individual animals, how do you then relate to Article 8H? Even if I argue that those provisions mean that you should take cognizance of individual animals and their interests. I think what one can say is that intrinsic value of the whole requires the consideration of different forms of protection for animals. That formula is evident from the obligation in Article 8H. So intrinsic value needs to be interpreted in terms of this reconciliation between individual and whole. And that is important. It does not exclude individual intrinsic value. And there is that potential for the reconciliation of the whole and individual. And for me, the potential lies in the, the possibility of considering, in this instance, international wild animal rights. Next slide, please. The problem with this argument is quite interesting. I'm proposing things and I'm shooting it down. I don't know if that's a very, very valid approach. But I think it is important to take note of the problems that actually arise when you make these proposals. The one central sort of uh, form of critique against this proposal that's always been is the fact that if you award rights to, to in this instance, wild animals, it means that humans will have to intervene in order to ensure that those rights are, are actually upheld, which means that we as humans, let's say the right to life, will need to end all forms of predation through genetic, ma genetic manipulation, meaning that lions will then have to graze, for instance, while in killing gazelle. That is the logical outcome of this argument. And it's, it's been used frequently as a form of opposition against animal rights theory. I do not agree with it in the context of wild animals. It is my opinion that recognizing that wild animals are subjects of life, that recognition implies a requirement to treat wild animals with respect. And that, that recognition of respect relates to the need to, rec to recognize their need to flourish in accordance with their biological nature. That is a recognition both on the species level but also as individuals. It does not mean we should intervene to such an extent that we end all forms of predation through intrusive measures because that is not needed to fulfill the need for intrinsic value, meaning flourish in accordance with their biological nature. That sort of approach would essentially lead to a continuation and perpetuation of what I refer to as a form of anthropocentric colonization, which means that we as humans continue our form of unwarranted and unwanted interference. And essentially it leads to distortion of the equilibrium in the biosphere. And that distortion is based on the ignorance of human beings concerning that equilibrium because we do not have the scientific knowledge or full understanding 
of those in, sort of intricate complexities pertaining to the biosphere. So I'm very much opposed to stating that if you agree to rights, that will be the outcome. What we should do rather is, on the basis of that recognition of our destructive nature as human beings, what we should do is rather to imagine the positive duties needed to, in order to ensure protection based on the anthropocentrism and anthropogenic consequences that we've created. And I think in this instance, and we can discuss it during Q&A further, especially those areas of the intrusive measures that I've referred to, I think it was the first slide, where I referred to captivity as an ex situ conservation measure. Because there what we've done is, through that captivity, through our anthropogenic actions, we've changed the relationship with wild animals, and we've decreased the social justice. And it's that change that compels us, that mandates us, that obliges us to now also change the legal relationship with those wild animals. Next slide, please. So it's my view that there's a potential for international wildlife rights to respond to these increase, sort of increasing ex situ conservation measures in conjunction with a welfareist approach. And I think the, the, there are certain rights that I've discussed in the publication uh, relating to freedom and the environment or habitat and the prohibition against cruel treatment. Those are some of the, the core rights when we talk about wild animal rights. I'm not supporting a generic right to life for all wild animals because that is in contravention with this approach that we have. Nature is cruel. In nature you die. And the one thing that I do think I find very problem, I've had this philosophical discussion the previous week when someone talked about death. And I said, memento mori, memento mori, I don't know if you've ever heard this, it's Latin for reflect on your own death. I this is now becoming really, <laughs> really dire. But the importance is to understand that we share with other animals, we as animals, in the king, in the animal kingdom, in the biosphere, we share the need to die, to regenerate through death. So it's memento mori. And therefore it's not a right to end all suffering or to stop death, because that is contra-natural. But it is a right for enhanced, bolstered protection based on the consequence of what we, have, what we as humans have actually done. So for me, in terms of the example that I've given alien invasive species, the welfare needs of individual wild animals will, will be, should be protected in accordance with their dignity, which I've referred to initially. And that will have to be balanced in terms of their place in the population, community and ecosystem, so the species concept. So it's that constant balancing of individual and holism. This does not spend, spell the end of all ex situ initiatives. I'm not stating we, we, you know, we need to disregard ex situ, because the CBD clearly contains a reference to ex situ conservation measures. It's mandate, well, it's, it's, it's warranted in terms of the CBD. But rather to follow a more restrictive approach which takes, rec uh, which takes cognizance of the needs of those individual animals. And I think what I also argue in the paper is that zoos, animal theme parks, wild factory farming and so forth will be difficult to justify as ex situ conservation measures. I think not only based on wealthy needs, but also based on the need for conservation. Species, individual, once again that balancing act. Next slide, please. I just need to, how long do I have? I'm just talking. I don't even know. We can really move a lot about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Can you just speak for another 10 minutes? Okay, I'll do it maybe in five even. But I just want, well, I don't know what my, the amount of time is, but thank you for that. So I can continue. So what we see is, the importance of the, rec the recognition of that phenotype of intrinsic interests. So
so protecting against human induced suffering. We also see that there's a need to take cognizance of the dignity of animals based on science essentially, biological sciences, cognitive and sensory and emotional life with a recourse to evolutionary biology. So there's a clear important scientific concept embedded in here. And we see that human actions will are bound to have this increasingly intrusive impact on animals. And therefore dignity requires us to ensure that they flourish in accordance with their nature. That is essentially what I've argued for up until now. And I've also indicated there's a possibility to reconcile the, those difficult, the, the difficult tension underlying my proposal. What I would like to do last is to give you a few examples of what I have in mind, because it's been quite abstract until now, and therefore open for uh, attack. If we take cognizance of the actions that can constitute constraints, there are quite a few. Captivity, hunting, trapping, habitat encroachment, those are all of the potential intrusive measures. Next slide, please. And therefore, on that basis, I think that sort of, that challenge should be met by law. And therefore, in terms of my proposal, the normative framework that the blueprint for international human rights framework could be transposed to this to the sort of conundrum that we are facing. And I think the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and the subsequent governance and the instruments that we found could be a blueprint for the development of specific group-based wild animal rights based on their non-exclusionary dignity in response to intrusive ex situ measures. I've, I'm going to give you one example before I conclude. The example, just to make it a bit more concrete, and I'm going to use this example to confuse, maybe to confuse myself further. There, is, there was a French initiative in the 70s for a universal declaration of animal rights, which I found quite useful. It became obscure to an extent because of a lack of support, and it was in the 70s. So one needs to take cognizance of the, the contextual circumstance in the 70s. But I think there's, a, there's an opportunity to do something similar now in order to formulate a soft law instrument similar to this for all animals. And then on that basis to work on dignity in order to create those those specific group-based rights. The one example that I've used, because it's, it's a, a topic that I've worked uh, extensively on, currently um, completing a paper on the tension between um, Aboriginal subsistence whaling and the right to culture of whales. And so that's why I've chosen this theme. There was an initiative by a, a group of academics, the Declaration of the Rights for Cetaceans. And I, and I thought that would be, that's sort of a, quite an interesting uh, template which one could utilize. There's one thing you can read through. The one thing that I find quite interesting, there you have a right to life. And I've chosen this as an example to indicate that in, you know, in a generic sense, I'm not supporting a right to life, but based on non-exclusionary dignity, one can then formulate a right to life for Cetaceans. And that is based on the evolution of biology and science, but also the near and right to life in terms of hunting, not in terms of predation. Because whale killing is never humane. It's impossible to conduct humane whale killing. That was also one of the resolutions of the IWC. So for me, this was quite an interesting sort of example. I would like to highlight two further aspects. The one is, in this publication, I've actually indicated that a group-based right for, for wildlife, so a right to the environment, could be an in, sort of fertile ground for further inquiry. That's one thing. Uh, the right to habitat or the right to the environment because of climate change and so forth. So that's one interesting right. The other right that I'm currently working on 
is the, and it also referred to the, uh, the right not to be subject to the disruption of their cultures. And Hal Whitehead, or Hal Whitehead has actually published uh, uh, quite a few papers and books on the issue of the culture of Wales, but also primates. And the linkages between culture, I'm not going to deal with that now, the linkages between culture and welfare, I'm, I'm currently offering a, a piece on that as well. And that, so those are potential rights that we can think of. But if you compare that to the rights for, for instance, um, a different animal, and let, let's say a, a, a gazelle, there would be a sort of a different formulation based on that dignity that I've spoken about. But I think these are some interesting aspects that require further uh, consideration. So culture, um, natural environment, but also cruel treatment, by treatment. Article 2, not to be removed from the natural environment. So the issue of zoos coming to the fore. Next slide, please. And lastly, I'm not going to, so I'm going to more or less end with this because I don't want to speak any further. Um, I won't analyze this, I'm just showing it. In domestic case law, I think um, domestic case law does sort of, to an extent, illustrate my own thinking in terms of reconciliation between individual and holism is the Estrelita case. I don't know if you've read it, but that's a very interesting case where there's a clear reconciliation between the rights, the rights of nature and individual animal rights. And, and, and in a very interesting manner, the court actually, through an exercise, reconciled those rights. I'm not going to deal with that. We can discuss it during Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's the last slide. Yeah, it's the last slide. So I've said a lot, I've spoken a lot, and I think I need to conclude. Just three, four, three or four last comments before I conclude. So my proposal is for the protection of wild animals, specifically wild animals, under the rubric of animal rights, but specific group-based rights based on non-exclusionary dignity. It is not for a further colonization of nature, but it's based on the recognition of the need for the increased protection in the age of the Anthropocene for all animals, including also wild animals. That sort of proposal is an acceptance of the increased responsibility of us as humans as a consequence of our human dominance on the planet. And that proposal for international wildlife rights based on non-exclusionary dignity should always take place within the confines and understanding and recognition of the intrinsic value of species, but also individual animals to ensure that we as human beings keep within the limits of the need for animals to flourish in accordance with their intrinsic value and, and biological needs. And I'd like to conclude with three quotes that I've included from one of my favorite books. And I'll just quickly read it out. An android doesn't care what happens to another android. That's one of the indications we look for. Maybe this was the last spider, the last living spider on earth. In that case, it's all over for spiders too. It, he thought. She keeps calling the owl it. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I'm open to respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Stoltz, for that really thought-provoking and uh, insightful presentation. We do have some questions in the chat, and you are also welcome to raise your questions. I think I will kick off with a question, just to open discussion and to set the tone. Uh, so, for schools, I attended a workshop for the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights last year, and there was a lot of contestation between those motivating for rights of nature and those motivating for individual animal rights, and at least to my mind, they shouldn't be contesting approaches, they should complement each other, and I think the Estradita case does this well. So I'd like you to, if possible, elaborate on your thoughts. Are these contesting or complementary approaches? 
And then I wanted to link that to, I think, the work of Cormac Cullinan and others on rights for the Antarctic or Antarctica, and how you propose your approach could be applied in that context. And then I'll let you answer that. We'll give the audience opportunities and then move to the online questions. Put it on my... I've actually just, thank you, Andrew, before I uh, continue that discussion, I've forgotten about the last slide that I actually had, which I'll show you uh, when we return. So in terms of that, um, the, the, the Cambridge Centre, I think the next event that we'll have is, is a forthcoming event where we'll discuss the rights of nature again. Um, and we just appointed a um, chair in the rights of nature at Southampton University, uh, Professor Gilbert. So, that is exactly the crux of the matter here, is the reconciliation between those components. Uh, some scholarship have also dealt with this issue, I think the transnational environmental law, roughly a year ago, dealt with this, because that's, that it, that's exactly the issue here, the fact that you have odorism and individualism. And previously, um, those animal rights, uh, or exponents of animal rights theory, actually felt that the, the, the rights of nature would dispel the protection that they seek. Um, so it's exactly the, the sort of exactly the issue that I've dealt with here. And one could transpose some of my ideas to that debate or discourse. I have not, um, in this publication, dealt with that in detail, um, the, the tension between those two groups. I do, however, think if you go back to where this tension stems from in scholarship, um, you will read the work of Alistair Gunn, for instance, Beckhoff, and so forth. There was this, this series of publications in environmental ethics where they, they talked about um, marriage and divorce between the two groups. And you can see that progression from an absolute dichotomy between the two groups towards where we are now. And I think we've moved to a position where it would be really difficult to, to hold the view that these are really very extreme um, sort of possessions on the spectrum. So what I do think is I think there's a clear movement to its reconciliation. And for me the best way, as you've mentioned, is estrelita. If we take cognizance of the meaning and implication of intrinsic value and the two components, the genotype and the phenotype, then what we can see is if we use the rights for nature, it does not exclude individual animal rights. But there is that necessity for balancing um, those, those, well, putative uh, opposing views. So I, m my view is that there is no, there is no, if you support the rights of nature, it does not exclude animal rights. Okay. That, that's the what. Well, that's one side of it. When I say this, on that spectrum, you obviously may have different scholars with different views. My view here is obviously that when, you know, while animal rights, as I see it, would not cause that. And that's because it is linked to intrinsic value. And the right, rights of nature, that framework, is also linked to intrinsic value. So it's on the basis of a communal sort of linkage or value that you move forward. Where you obviously have a very strong sense that animal rights should always lead to abolition, and that animal rights should lead to the end of predation, yes, then obviously there is clearly a dichotomy. But I don't think it is worthwhile to sustain that chasm in an artificial manner. But it depends on your point of view. But my proposal was formulated essentially to ensure that if you have, uh, if you award the rights of, na you know, rights of nature, then you can also take cognizance of animal rights. And essentially, Estrelita, what Estrelita did was, Estrelita indicated that the rights of nature provided for individual animal rights through the principles of interpretation that they used. So there's actually, if you have the rights of nature, then you, know, you also have the, 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 or the, the, the wild animal rights for individual animals. judgments coming out of Ecuador on recognizing that rights of nature doesn't exclude individual animal rights. Do we have 
any questions from the audience who are here in person? There are two, um, Brighton and then Abigail. Okay, uh, I'm sure probably for the benefit of those online, I might need the mic. Professor Scholes, it's good to see you here. It's good to have you back home. Um, you know, I'm a retired as environmental as law scholar, if I may call myself that. So uh, some people might be surprised as to why is he interested in environmental law? Because I, I um, that that's something that I was introduced to some years ago. And so I'm an outsider now, you know, to international environmental law and particularly animal rights law, but something intrigued me in what you were saying. Within the context of holism and individualism, if I can call it, I was wondering in the proposition that you make here, that um, I was just wondering, within the context of that tension, I was just wondering how you would balance rights. I saw when you uh, spoke about you know these rights in Article One, Article Three, Article Five, Article Six, like right to life and protection of right to freedom and residence, you know, as within animals' natural habitat, if I can call it, and protection of their natural environment, and 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 right not to be subject to the disruption of animal cultures. I was just wondering. Um, how does one balance that? Maybe I will explain where my thoughts are coming from. My thoughts are coming from a decision that seems to have been taken by the government of Zimbabwe, for example, to cull elephants. Mm -hmm. And I thought it could provide people with a potential paper there. And uh, so my old interest in environmental law was kind of stayed up when I thought about that. How does one balance all these rights? The fact that there is, you know, as El Nino inspired drought, um, there is no water within the ecosystem, there is competition from animals, you know. So I was thinking about the, this whole tension between holism and individualism and uh, the, the, the decision making which has to be made by government to kind of ease the pressure. What would animal rights activists say about all of that? How, how does one have to balance all of these tensions? And what I was thinking about was, do we move some of the animals, instead of culling them, would that be seen as cruelty to animals? Would moving them, say, instead of killing them, because I'm thinking, man, it's elephants that we're talking about. Instead of killing them, would it not make sense to move them and migrate them probably to another country? And, and uh, how would all this balancing work? It just got me interested. May I respond? Much? Yes, thank you, Brian. That's, that's an excellent question. It also points to the fact that what I've presented here was a summation of a paper that actually established um, sort of the tenets of awarding international wildlife rights. But then the practical application of those rights would be the next step. And you have just chosen the most sensitive and contentious issue, and maybe the most difficult issue as well, and that is elephant culling, which also occurred in South Africa. And it's still an issue frequently that is debated. I had some interesting discussions about this issue the previous week with uh, representatives of uh, some parks and so forth, and we talked about this matter. So I think the one, the one aspect to take cognizance of when we talk about balancing of rights is the recognition, that we, you know, we all know that it's also the Constitution is the same, is that no rights are absolute. And we do the same in terms, so we have the same sort of approach in terms of human rights where we do uh, conduct sort of tests of proportionality, for instance, so we have those mechanisms available in order to do a balancing of rights. The, the question concerning cunning is a really difficult issue because the question is how do you now, so first of all you would need to establish what the rights of the elephants are in terms of group-based rights based on non-exclusionary dignity, 
So we recognize the sentience of elephants. They're very intelligent animals. They, um, the, the, for instance, the issue of culture, the disruption of culture can also occur here because of the matriarchs that you have. So it's a, it's a very good example. I, um, I didn't touch up on, on this because I dealt with, I thought about this issue for a while. And it's actually the, hopefully, the theme of a forthcoming publication. Um, and hopefully I can present it at one of the forth, you know, forthcoming events when I have time to write this paper, which I don't really have at this stage. But the issue there is, so if in terms of culling, you have certain rights for those elephants, um, and I don't want to preempt the exact formulation, but what we do know is that the highly sensitive and intelligent animals, and we need to prevent suffering. So on the one hand, culling is needed, prima facie, for the whole, for the species. Although even that argument is very difficult because, as my one colleague said, we don't cull people, we cull animals. So how do we, you know, it's a very difficult, there's, there was even some, when, we talked, when I talked with these colleagues of mine, they even contested the fact that you need to do culling in order to have a certain form of vegetation there. So, the, so even that is problematic, but let's go into that. So I think in this instance my proposal was that when we deal with these very complex issues and we need to engage in you know, eradication, culling, termination, my sense was that if we follow this approach, and this may be very contentious, I'm, I need to work, I just had this idea the previous week, what we need to do is do something I refer to as mimicry, whereby you mimic natural processes of nature. So rather than flying with a helicopter and shooting elephants, because that will cause considerable intergenerational trauma, what you then do is you mimic certain events in nature, in, which will then lead to starvation. I realize that even that is a very difficult concept, and that's why I'm honest about the fact that it's a very, you know, I've just, I just came up with this concept actually a week ago, and I need to work on it further. But that, so there are certain, if you follow this approach in a logical fashion, I think it would be easier to, to, to move to its areas of resolve. Um, but, but very difficult, very complex issues. And I think those issues require further exploration, deliberation, and discussion. But a really good question. Thank you. Uh, Abigail, and then we have quite a few questions from the online audience. Um, I think my question is how or have you addressed how an approach that focuses on individualism um, when it pertains to animal rights would most likely harm um, indigenous communities more so than um, corporate companies that exploit animals and abuse them more often. The example you used um, in a paper that I think you referred to was um, subsistence whale farming by Aboriginal people who are indigenous people to um, the Greenlands, Russia, um, and select small developing islands. In South Africa, a case in around 2009 um, that we saw an indigenous community being harmed or their right to culture being, um, well, I would say questioned, right, by an animal rights organization um, because they were slaughtering animals to practice their culture. Um, how would you, or how have you addressed that oftentimes um, individual animal rights are harming, are, are not targeting the right places that could make the most um, harm to animals? Okay, that's a very complex question once again. The paper that I've written will give you those answers, but I don't have time to deal with all those aspects. Let me just say two things. The one thing is, your question actually relates to culture and right to cultural diversity. Um, and that relates to cultural re relativism. So there are a few things that we can say. Um, the, 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 the paper that I've dealt with does not deal with uh, major agricultural companies and factory farming, so it's wild animals. 
There's a, so there's a whole issue that we can address in terms of factory farming of animal farms done by corporations. When we move to its indigenous peoples, um, the issue there is cultural diversity and right to culture. But we need to take cognizance of the emergence of the recognition of the sentience and suffering of individual animals. So it does not mean ab initio ad infinitum that, that right to diversity can be upheld always. And I don't think, so it's all about targeting certain people. It's about how do you reconcile, and this paper that I've, that I've talked about, which I'll hopefully publish next year, is how do you reconcile the right to cultural diversity on the basis of existing international law with that recognition of individual animals? In whaling, the issue there is that Aborigines, when they, when they hunt whales, the suffering of those animals are um, in usually even worse than when they hunted with, you know, killed with, with harpoons by, by, by a normal whale, normal whalers. So the issue is there, how do you protect the animal, but also recognize the, recognize the right? And um, so I've, dealt, I've, I've written a paper on that issue because it's really complex. The one thing that I can say is, what we can't do, and St. Granadine's uh, would be the best example, the fact that injustice has occurred against certain indigenous groups, and they have. Um, slavery in St. Granadine's is a good example. They've never been Aboriginal subsistence whalers, because it's a, it is a, uh, um, in St. Granadine's, it is a transposition of colonization, which they took over. And at the, the International Whaling Commission, when this was you know, brought to the fore, they immediately said, but you know, we can't talk about it because we were colonized and we were slaves. We can't let individual animals pay for that injustice. So for me, that is not the way to go about this. And it is about ensuring that we reconcile the diversity, taking cognizance of the culture of people, but also recognizing that culture changes. It is not, it's dynamic. So maybe at the next event I'll present that paper because it's a really, really difficult, complex, and controversial issue. But it is to an extent about balancing again. How do you balance these issues? And how do you balance it when scientific knowledge actually changes your perceptions and approaches about these things? The, one, the most important thing would be the shared issue of natural justice. So that one injustice against the national, uh, the indigenous people, do not lead to injustice against other vulnerable entities. You have that shared vulnerability, and that is very important. Thank you. All right, we have a few questions from the online audience. So the one is from Duncan Brown, asking if catch and release fishing, that's usually described as sustainable, will have an implication on individual rights, and should it be banned? as it has been banned in Germany and Switzerland. And then there's a question about... Sorry. About South Africa's game meat strategy that is about increasing um, commercial farming of wild animals in South Africa. What are your thoughts on that? And will animal welfare you know, increase their protection? Those are two, and I'll ask you two more. Okay. And then just sorry, before you answer, for those of you, if you can stay to the end, please do because there is some refreshments outside. And we have an announcement about further events. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. So the first question concerning uh, catch and release, release, that's a very good question. I don't have a straightforward answer there. If we go back to what I've mentioned previously, I know there are very interesting debates and discourse concerning the issue of, of fish and so forth and other animals. Um, in, in aquaculture and, 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 and so forth. So I think in that instance, if the, and I don't have sufficient knowledge to address that, let me just be honest, I, I think if the, the, the science indicates, and so far my knowledge at this stage it does, is that um, catch, and release, catch and release results in uh, sort of unnecessary suffering, then obviously that could lead to a formulation of a policy or rights or a welfareist approach which we prevented. So I think that is exactly what I've argued for. The second issue is exactly what I've, it's the best example of what, I'm, what I actually wanted to indicate. Because what we see is we are moving towards, so we had factory farming, 
and factory farming being disastrous for ecology, for wealth, but also for, for the health of people. And, and that's where you actually have you know, these major corporations. Um, and I think doing the rise in scanning, I think uh, litigation against those companies will be a major issue, similar to climate change litigation. The similarities are remarkable. So, so the, the thing there is, what you can see is you also have an already transposition of that model to wild animals. That becomes even more problematic in relation to wild animals because of that intrinsic value component. And in the paper I've also indicated that, that one could use this um, because frequently factory farming, in fact what I'm referring to is wild factory farming, is actually done on the basis, on, you know, under the guise of conservation. But it's never conservation. It's about profit. So if you use this to bolster the protection of those animals, you can actually address and prevent that. And therefore, I think such a sort of such a, a, an approach would really be helpful to counter that increase because it will, it's not only in South Africa for gay men. We have it in China. We have it in other countries because it's it's about one thing and one thing only. It's about money. And say, you know, if you have that as your only motive, it's always the same thing. Whether it's factory farming in terms of animals, of, 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 of um, farm animals, or wild animals. I just think the suffering in terms of wild animals will be even worse. And you can see that, you know, in the examples. Uh, the best example would be lions in captivity in South Africa. is a really good example. So, for me, this would be a very valuable framework on the international to deal with those issues. Thanks, yeah, the, the comment is also that South Africa's game meat strategy aims to promote the sustainable use of animals, and so does the CBD. So seemingly, at least on paper, it looks like our law is aligned to the CBD. Well, so, I'm going to say something really horrible now. Please read my paper <laughs> in the, in the, in the recul, because I've written exactly about sustainable use and what it means. And it should also be ethical. Alright, so another question is whether the term or the phenomenon of ecocide, as we understand it, can help at all in protecting individual animal rights? And then what are your thoughts on the focus or the conflict potentially between the rights of wild animals versus domesticated animals? I think there are two questions and one question concerning ecocide in terms of international criminal law, which has now, I don't know, I've observed the growing trends in relation to arguments made for ecocide. So obviously, um, I'm not, I don't want to deal with the merits of the legislative, you know, we don't have to go into the merits of that because that's a different matter altogether. What one can say is, and, and once again, I'm not supporting the proposals for ecocide. So obviously, if there is a, a sort of a movement towards a recognition of ecocide in the Rome Statute, that will be predominantly focused on species, so the whole. But that would automatically also, in various instances, have an effect on individual animals. So, um, so it's, 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 it's that focus on ecosystems and the whole that could also potentially be beneficial to individual animals. Not that I'm supporting because we need a longer discussion about ecocide and the merits and the legal merits, but there is that potential for it. Thank you. And the last question was just on if you have thoughts about the individual rights of domesticated animals versus wild. So, well, anything, thanks. Yes, so I've not excluded um, awarding rights to domesticated animals or f farm animals or uh, bolstering their protection. I have just focused on wild animals. But in terms of the structure that I've created for the normative framework, the group based wild animal rights would be under a gen generic rubric of animal rights. So under animal rights, you will also have rights for individual domesticated animals. Now, the, the difficult thing here is obviously to, is, is, is the definition or the categorization of wild and domesticated in the current context. And some interesting work has been done uh, in the book in Zopolis, uh, Zopolis um, concerning the distinction between liminal wild and domesticated animals, for instance, because the, the category of, or the categorization will result in a certain form of protection. But my view is that my proposal for wild rights would function within that spectrum of, of animal rights. Um, 
So I don't, I don't see it as, 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 a, as potentially as, or as conflict per se, but as something that actually forms part and parcel of the international protection of all animals, but recognizing the relational situation, locational differences, and therefore adjusting the form of protection to ensure that it's in accordance with the intrinsic value of individual as well as animals at the species level. Thank you, I appreciate it, and thank you for our in-person audience and online audience. Let's give cross calls a hand up. Thank you very much for your time. Just a small note from me. Um, there are exciting things happening at the Global Environmental Law Center. First of all, we have a six-week short course on constitutional law and nature. And it has very um, significant components on animal rights, animal welfare and rights of nature and the constitutionalization of that. So six weeks starting in October. Then we have a very exciting partnership with the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights in the UK. It's a center that's part of Cambridge University. We're going to establish the African Hub on Perspectives on Rights of Nature and Animals. We're launching that in April next year with a big event. I hope to invite you across course to speak at that event. And then we're also launching another master's module next year on animal rights and will focus comparatively uh, also on the African context. So watch our pages, keep attending our events, and thank you for joining. There is some refreshments outside, so please join us for that. Thanks, everyone.